everyone. Hello, I am Genzaki, and this is the Midnight Gaming Podcast. Like the slow go right there, my friend. Good stuff, good stuff. I'm Eddie Phoenix. <laughs> hey, Midnight Gaming TCG Forum. I'm Balzac, and I'm legal now, so stop bugging me. No, <laughs> it was me who was bugging you, so nah. <laughs> okay, Eddie, stop bugging me. I bug all the peoples. Come to the site. We. Yeah, today is um, or we this week cookies. has been very slow for gaming news, like like a slug. Eugh. So we're I've... going to be talking about RPGs. Um, I'm assuming it's everyone here's favorite topic because it's my favorite topic. It's my favorite topic too. Yeah, there we go. I love RPGs. It's just, the best games come out of RPGs. It, uh, I'm sorry, Silent Hill too. You can beat me later. I have a plan. Whenever I can, rec- whenever I can record from my TV again, I am going to do a stream at some point. It's going to be 100 hours of 10 RPGs. <laughs> Dear God. I don't know which 10 yet, but yes. I could put 100 hours into a single RPG. Well, I want to get t- give 10 RPGs a total of 10, 10 hours each, and I would just oh, decide, okay. decide which 10, you know, whenever I put together the list. Yeah. Anyway... Um, so let's get started. Um, first we'll discuss where RPGs come from. Um, I think it was sometime around the 60s, a giant nerd by the name of Gary Gygax, uh, came up with the idea of using graph paper and dice to make a game called Dungeons and Dragons. And there may have been one before this, but I'm not aware of it. Dungeons and Dragons is, as far as I know, awesome. And nerdy. Like all RPGs. Yeah, the idea is that you um, get a custom-built story by your dungeon master. You uh, build your character, uh, set your skills, earn experience, and um, slay dragons along the way. So, obviously, when video games come around, we get a They can randomize, of, the, uh, randomize the dragons, no DM included. Exactly. Uh, the DM becomes the game, or the developer. Who uh, creates a scenario for you and you play it? Um, I'm and, okay yeah, with that. We've already discussed the split, but uh, to a quick summary, um, once RPGs came around, um, the Western audience, for the most part, decided to create Dungeons and Dragons style games where you are the character. So the character is normally a blank slate, um, no personality except what you ascribe to them, and um, they have all the combat, the skills, that kind of thing. Whereas the Japanese RPGs, they wanted to, they used the system to make um, story-driven games because uh, the system allowed, especially in its turn-based nature, allowed for them to um, make a mild gameplay experience to uh, hold up the shell of a massive story, which is just plain awesome. Exactly. And it, and it holds true to the D&D style as well when it comes to like, the turn-based system. Mm-hmm. So really, like, uh, sometimes they don't have an initiative with the characters from the JRPG side of things with, like, ambushes or preemptive attacks if you sneak up on an enemy. Or whenever it just, like, comes time for it, it's, like, the speed of your character and the other people who are you're facing against... And that isn't to say the uh, Western RPGs, uh, there aren't the ones with the turn-based elements. There are always games like the Roguelikes, um, based on Rogue itself, which is a turn-based uh, dungeon crawler. But um, and, uh, for the most uh, part, they try and make you as much of a part of the action as possible. I'm going to disagree a little bit with, with uh, well, especially with the early RPGs, with, with, with Japanese games. It's not so much that um, the gameplay was flimsy just to hold up the story is the gameplay became as much as, you know, especially with the battle system and the options you were given became just as important as the story itself. It's just unlike other types of games and genres of games, the the Japanese RPG is is very heavily story driven. And I'm I'm going to say that, you know, the gameplay, you know, especially in the good ones is just as deep. Yeah. I'm not going to, uh, I, I don't think I said they are flimsy. It's just, um, they, there were limitations, and they used the limitations to their advantage instead of their disadvantage. Which is always a good thing to just be able to push the limits of what you can do 
Because, I mean, like, take a look at it now. If, if we had some of these RPGs that came out back in the 80s and the 90s, think if we had those now? I mean, can you imagine the kind of... Ex- would the experience be as, as enriching as it is now? Or would it be, you know... Yeah, because you would... notice around uh, Final Fantasy is a good uh, tree to cut in half and count the rings. Uh, you'll notice that the... Um, as they moved along, they moved from turn-based combat to um, a real-style turn-based combat where um, you still have to select the moves of your guys, but uh, if you're too slow, your uh, opponent may get a couple moves in on you. And well, that is Chrono kind Trigger of had where... that in the 90s. Yes, it did. But you could choose not to do that. I like playing it that other way because it added a, little bit of, added a little bit of tension. Yeah, yeah it adds the... Um... I, I prefer to. Um, it, it, I guess it depends on the game. I normally prefer them to be turn-based uh, strictly, so that I, if I, I don't have to pause the game to walk away. I can just set down the controller. And... <laughs> but it's also the tactical element allows me to sit there and think. Whereas, um, say, Final Fantasy VII requires you to um, make your decisions fast, or you're going to get triple attacked. See, that's where it got me because like right after the whole like right when you got it to 10 after 10 it kind of broke me but i think we can discuss this a little bit later we can or do we want to just go ahead and discuss it now um i think we'll move on to the uh segment that it's what makes an rpg an rpg okay and as we mentioned with dungeons and dragons um it, it's it's role playing you, you're at first they put you into a role in western rpgs they you are the a hero in Japanese RPGs, they say, um, and this is style. I'm not actually saying because there are plenty of Western RPGs that do this and plenty of Japanese RPGs that do that. But they, in the Japanese style, they put you into a role that they have crafted for you, and you are to act as that character. Um, other elements include obviously the experience system. It doesn't have to be an experience system, but the idea is that uh, your character grows in strength. Uh, to build up uh, more uh, magic, physical abilities, sk- particular skills, that kind of thing. Well, the idea it, is it, to grow with your or your character to grow as you get better. Wh- whether they call it an experience system or not, that's exactly what it is. So you yeah. get po- you get points. You know, it may just be points just because of actions. Or there are some RPGs where using something gives you points in that. You know, either way, you're building up points to mm-hmm. level up in advance. It's all about um, your no matter how they ter- they ter- uh, term it, that's exactly what it is. And if you don't have that, plainly you're not an RPG. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so you have um, to grow with like strength, HP, magic, or you know maybe you're the monk character, or you know, just whatever character you're playing as. You're gonna be mainly having those points be spent into those stats. And that's actually what I think is one of the main things that make an RPG an RPG is it is no matter whether it's an action RPG or a straightforward turn-based, is it will always be uh, heavily involved with with your with stats, and um, what was the other thing? I had two things and I forgot it. It's very it's very stat driven, and it's very customization uh, customization slash tactical driven. Mm-hmm. Even in your very basic RPGs, there will, there will always be elements of uh, being be, being statistically driven, and where you're going to have a lot of uh, customization options. Mm-hmm. And something of note is that uh, the game doesn't always have to tell you what your stats are. They can hint at stats being increased while keeping those hidden. To uh, uh, a lot of people like that style to give it a bit more mystery and. Um, some consider it less complex than when you can see the numbers and affect them on a micromanaging scale. It depends on what the RPG is. Action RPG, for the most part, it really doesn't make much of a dis- difference. There will be some people who would like to tweak their character the way they want it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, when you get to the more turn-based and some of the more hardcore RPGs, you can get really into micromanaging your st- stats. Yeah. Um, I think while we're, ta- while, while we're talking about it, there's a lot of games nowadays um, where they are using RPG elements, um, for example, the leveling up and experience system. 
but they're not really an RPG. They're basically borrowing the borrowing those elements to give a sense of progression. And yeah, there's a and, lot of um, a lot, lot of genres that are kind of blending to, things together. Um, yeah, a lot of games like Gears of War use it less to uh, they to give the sense of progression, but also to uh, manage their unlocks so that you know how close you are or have a relative um, barometer for how close you are to getting a particular, say, skin for a character or a particular gun. Yeah, and really, with that, you don't... That's not. I wouldn't consider that RPG at like any level at all. It's just more like a level-up yeah. system. That's it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, sports games have, have deep customization issue, uh, levels now. Certain things like beat 'em ups, like uh, castle crawlers, level up system, and it has a pseudo experience system as well. The reason I wouldn't call it an RPG is if you're playing it, it's very clearly a beat 'em up. Um, you're beating things up. It's not even an action RPG because while you have health and magic bar, is that magic bar will automatically refill. Basically, there's no reason really. You know, it, it's just limiting how much magic you can cast. So it's really not a true MP bar. And while there's a little bit of, a cu- of customization, it's not stats like this one up, this one up, this one up. It's, okay, you level up. Now, what would you like to tweak for your character? Which is not exactly, which is not really the same thing. And RPGs, even with your basic action RPGs, they're a lot more complicated when you get into statistics and customization. You can customize them a lot more than something like Castle Crashers. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Now, there are some games that really do blend that line, and you're not really sure what to make of it. Some people call Zelda an RPG, and it's clear, clearly not an RPG. It's an action-adventure game. It's action-adventure. Because, action because it, I normally call it Link, right Link does not um, get experience points. He does not level up. Um, you really don't have much customization offerings. Yes, he has HP and magic, essentially, but you're in charge of how it grows and how fast it grows. The closest I think Zelda ever got to being an RPG was probably Zelda 2 because you, you did have – and I'm going to throw this out there. The battle system has a lot to do with what makes an RPG an RPG, mainly um, how you encounter enemies. That's why Castle Crashers is not an RPG is because it is a beat-em-up. You, know, you, you scroll – you run to the, ro- to the right, and you run to enemies, and you fight enemies. The uh, reason Zelda 2 is a little murky is because you can see that much like um, some modern-day RPGs, you can see enemies, uh, enemies on, the field, on the field system and go and attack them, and Link actually does level up in certain areas. Um, that's, that's, that's about as close as the game has gone to an RPG, and I'm going to leave that up to debate whether people want to say it's an RPG or not, but, you know, when, when it's, when yeah, it's I that... I think Zelda is one of the gray area games, because uh, that's our next thing, is yeah. the games that are in the gray area is... Um... I think Zelda 2 is one. Not not the other Zelda games, but the second Zelda game. Yeah, I I I personally put the Zelda games into the gray area because the um, their RP for me their RPG elements come in collecting their um the weapon the the items the weapons the claw shots all of that stuff that is the skills of the game where you would level up and get something in Zelda boom it's right there. Now, um, I I personally. Zelda, for the most part, I would not put in that gray area, just because, um, like I said, you don't have that deep customization, you don't have you don't have the experience uh, system, you don't have the the skills and the, the skills and stats system, and all the things that you say, well, that makes an RPG. Then you have to throw in every other adventure game, um, like um, the Prince of Persia games, Assassin's Creed games, because you do gain new abilities as well. Every single action game follows what Zelda does. And Zelda is clearly an action adventure game. Where I'm yeah. saying the Zelda I say that falls into the gray area is Zelda 2 because at that point they didn't know what they wanted Zelda to be. Um, Link actually does battle, d- does level up. He does have stats. He does have consumable magic. Um, he does have magical spells he can use. He has HP. He has MP. Uh, there are enemies running roaming around the battle battlefield. Um, and if, if it is an RPG, then it's an action RPG. It's really in the gray area. I don't know what to, what to call it. And just because the rest of the series is an action adventure, I kind of don't want to put in the RPG space. But yet, it has enough of those elements where I really wonder about it. Mm-hmm. How's about this? We call it horrible and call it a day. I won't say it's horrible. I think it, I, I just Zelda Two is scary. actually one of the more interesting of the games. I like it, it's it. just it's just it's it's NES hard, Eddie. Yeah. If if you don't want to play it, then don't play it. But almost everything that came out on the NES where it was that hard. Zelda One is hard. Mm-hmm. 
And I know that's that. Like that's the game. Zelda just makes the game short. Zelda two, you need to. Um... My words fail me. <laughs> you too. Most... Do, 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 do. Yeah. Use your words. Use your words. What words are those? Um, <laughs> Zelda two, you really need to grind. Jin, you're up. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I can see where you're coming from there. It's just uh, I, I'm not sure where I'm at with Zelda. Um, I've always considered it to have the RPG elements. Like maybe it's not an RPG, but it's got the elements. And yeah, that's where I pretty much stand on it. Is I, I look at the elements and I say uh, I can see the RPG in Zelda, and I can see why. Because a lot of another thing people see in it is uh, that uh, Link is one of those. Um, uh, Western blank everyman that um, people uh, can etch their personality onto because he doesn't have one of his own. Unless well, you count the TV series. Here's the thing. Here's Nintendo the thing has kind of designed him that way. Baba, you cut me off. Sorry. <laughs> I'll go and you cut me off almost. But anyway, um, <laughs> when it comes to the whole personality thing, when it comes to Western RPGs, you really can't program a personality into a character when it comes to Western RPGs because they're mainly left blank, not talking very much, if at all. And plus, if you could etch a personality into it, I'm pretty sure you could possibly etch it in your own or one you would want to choose. I mean, heck, if I was Link, I would say, screw everybody. I'm not going to save no daggone princess. Walk away. <laughs> True enough. Um, I guess that would fall under the refusal of the call part of the hero's journey, and your yeah. personal Link would therefore just say, screw it. Yeah. Exactly. What, and what I was trying to say is the reason that Link doesn't have that personality is because Nintendo has – they've even come out right out and say it. They've pr- they've purposely made him that way because they want people to think that – to feel that they are Link and are going on this adventure. Which is, again, it's that um, – if anything, that is the role-playing aspect. The very heart of it is yeah. actually playing the role. But I wanted to say this earlier, but if you're going to say that that's what makes an RPG an RPG, you can say every single game is essentially like that because you take on a role. Yeah, whether it's a like plumber, said, it's, uh, whether it's a plumber it a saving area. a princess or, you know, you know. Which is actually why uh, I was going to bring this up here is um, that for the most part, I think RPG is a misnomer because, like you said, every game is a role playing game. You're always in a role. You're always playing a game. It's kind of like other things that are misnomers, like graphic novels, comics, whatever. The thing is, you basically have to say, okay, you can't straight up say use the name to describe it. Mm-hmm. Is you have to look at what the genre is and then define it from that, which is what we did at the beginning, yeah. where we were t- that's saying I, that's the point I was trying yeah. to make, but you made it for me. Dang you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have become legal. <laughs> anyway. You're fireball. Get over here. <laughs> Segway into... Um, yeah. Magical segues. Um, yeah, we, we're, again, games that skirt the gray area. That's where I wanted to point is that the, we call them role-playing games, but <laughs> every game is a role-playing game. So this is more um, your tactical customization games. Um. Uh, and the next part we wanted to talk about were the games that have RPG elements without RPGs, and we kind of hit that with the uh, football games, the Gears of War. Um, I'm sure we can come up with more examples. So I, I gave Castle Crashers. Because yeah. Call of yeah. Call of Duty has it's where you can customize like gun skins and you know little icons for your character, or you know you're able to put certain weapons on or weapon uh, name things on. Mm-hmm. Uh, Blacklight get... Retribution is actually a good point for here because it's uh, one of those games where uh, the idea is the micromanagement of stats, and it's it's a first-person shooter, but you can break your gun down and you can put different things in to make, uh, change your stats uh, to fit them just where you want them, but that doesn't make it an RPG. That just uh, makes it a very in-depth shooter. S- some action-adventure games have very minor... Um... Experience and level up systems, but normally they're they're limited to doing certain things. You don't get experience just from doing everything. Like RPGs, tip- if you're playing an RPG, you're getting experience from from battles and 
from pretty much everything you're regularly regularly doing. Where in uh, the adventure, the action adventure games, if you're getting experience, it'll be for something minor like oh you've gone so so many of this or you know, for example, in Assassin's Creed in the Assassin's Creed games, oh you've um you found you've done such you've done so many of this optional thing here. Let's give you another thing onto your life bar. You know, it's not really level up. An experience system is a very very limited experience system that just rewards you with um, maybe an additional piece of health, but you have to do a lot to a lot to get it, and it really is not worth even mentioning that's an experience system. Honestly, one of my favorite new games that's come out recently, even though it did have a particularly bad ending in the third game, would be Mass Effect. Because, I mean, it's it's one of those games to where, like, in the very first game, they had this broad, and I do mean broad, level up and being able to spend points into certain skills to improve assault rifles, shotgun, uh, sniper rifles your intimidate, your charm, uh, health, everything else. You could spend it all into like all these things in the first one. In the second game, they really shrunk that down, which is a good thing to make it a little bit more simpler, a little bit more easy for everyone. Because mm-hmm, the, the, uh, the original one, you say it's broader, and I, I would say it's a bit overbroad because um, yeah. some of the skills were relatively useless. And um, one of the things that irritates me in RPGs is if you're not going to use a class system and you're just going to give me the ability to spend all these points, allow me to super grind and turn my character into a metaphorical Superman. That's one of the things <laughs> I love in these games. <laughs> I, don't, I love it, I love it. <laughs> Which is one thing I'll give to... Um, uh, to it uh, gives you enough experience points to max out almost everything. They um, leave you missing one final skill, depending in, on your uh, how your tree looks, which is nice. Um, and three has the element of giving, allowing you to choose one or the other skill, which is an interesting choice. I like that, especially in the uh, multiplayer aspect of it. It was pretty darn awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess we get to our the point we're going to like, and uh, that is the favorite, least favorite aspects of the game. And since I know what these two are going to say, I'm going to say uh, my combination, favorite, least favorite, is grinding. Pure and simple. Going out, killing lots of uh, pigs for experience to go beat up the big baddie of the land. Are we going to go one by one and explain it, or are we just going to start talking about it grinding? <laughs> well, I figured we'd start with grinding. Yeah. Because um, it's the most notorious aspect of the game. Yeah, I'm going to say, uh, as far as I think things I have a problem with with certain RPGs, at, basically, when we're talking about least favorite, is, you know, aspects that I think are, that when you're making an RPG, you need to watch out for and need to make sure you address. And grinding has to go under least favorite. I'm not saying that grinding essentially is bad, but my point is I don't mind I don't mind if a game has it where you can grind and some people enjoy to just go out and grind. I mean, Gonzaki, if you like to grind, then I have no problem with that. Mm-hmm. My my problem is when a game forces you to grind. Mm-hmm. We where you know, you're just playing the game regularly and when I'm saying I'm playing the game regularly, I mean, I'm any battle I get into, I'm facing, you know, so that means I am getting into a lot of battles, but even with me getting into a lot of battles, gaining requisite level ups by just playing the game, is I can't advance the story and I can't continue playing the game because the game says, "Oh, by the way, we're just going to murder you." That makes me want to put. That makes me get very frustrated and very bored with the game quicker than anything else. I think you know where you you can allow allow the player to grind if they want to is great, but I think that if you're playing the game regularly, where you're just facing battles like you regularly would, then you should be able to go through the game just fine and you not be punished for it. I think that's the thing. Being punished for not grinding is what I hate. Um, my golden boy, I'm going to be using this for a lot of examples, is I think a game that got this right was Chrono Trigger. Y- yes, you didn't have to face every single battle because you saw the enemies, you can avoid them. But for example, if you're like me, you're like, eh, why not? The, the battle system is fun in and of itself. I'm going to face these enemies. 
if you just play the game regularly, pretty much fighting er- anything you saw, and we're not going even out of your way to grind. I played through Chrono Trigger. I never had to had to go out of my way to grind in the entire game. I was able to play the game and beat every single boss. And the thing I loved about the game is I could play the game, and I felt that um, I was always at the right level to face the boss without even having to try. And I love that about the game. Um, you'll see a lot of – when they never talk about walkthroughs, they will talk about grinding, even in games that it doesn't make sense to grind. Um, tactical RPGs, why in the world do you have to grind? I'm talking about turn, pay, turn um, I'm talking about um, strategy RPGs, um, spe- especially when we're t- – my favorite strategy RPG series is the Shining Force subseries. Um, I, I don't know how many walkthroughs I've seen where they, where they talk about um, grinding for levels, which – really confuses me in the case of Shining Force because if you are grinding for levels in Shining Force, you're doing something wrong because that means either A, you're dying a lot, or B, you are forcibly retreating from battles just so you can get extra levels. You can play through Shining Force just fine, just being being the levels, and you will never have to grind. Um, That's why Final Fantasy Tactics really turned me off really quickly because I got got to a point... Early in the game, I'm talking like fifth battle, and I couldn't beat it because the game wants me to grind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Tactics had that uh, thing with me where it skirts the lines on both areas. If you don't grind, you won't be prepared for certain battles, and there's a battle in Act 3 or 4 that is annoying whether you grind or not, uh, into, up to a certain level. But the is other it Reoven's Castle? Point, um, it's the Assassin's. Okay, that's that's um that is number four. That's an act four. Yeah. With act three, Reoven's Castle kicked my ass the first few times. Uh, was is that when you fight um, uh, Wygraf again? When you fight right Wygraf again, yeah. Yeah, my I'm actually uh, going to explain this because this is where I broke the game, and this is where the game stops being fun for me. Is the only strategy I found for beating Wygraf uh, effectively. Um, is to run away from him while using uh, skills from your starter tree, which are Scream, which uh, raises your bravery, um, Accumulate, which raises your attack, and another skill I, I don't remember that raises your speed. And I just keep using those skills until my speed and attack is as high as it can go, and then I one-shot him. The problem with that is you gain so much experience doing this that you'll gain easily 14 levels before you can kill him effectively. Really? Yes. I honestly never did that. Yeah, that's the only I mean, way I could figure out for doing it. And, for me, I... Hmm? To be perfectly honest, for me, I legit level grinded for a little bit. Got my uh, HP up to where I could take about two to three shots with um, his lightning blade, and I would just crack him over the head with the bracer and holding, like, an ice brand or something. Yeah, I, uh, he always manages to one-shot me because I'm normally a ninja. So I, uh, nor- as a ninja, I have longer range of movement. So I put on a pair of boots that give me farther movement so I can escape his lightning blade. That's why. The whole ninja thing, they're li- the ninjas are really squishy. I used the knight when it came to me just cracking him over the head. Yeah, I can see that. And here's my thing also with tactics. I mean, I use tactics as an example for why I got frustrated with level grinding. But I think what really got me frustrated with tactics, and this has, this has nothing – that it has nothing to do with grinding, and it doesn't have, have anything to do with the least favorite aspect. But Final Fantasy Tactics just broke me because it had the um, – it had how, – how do I want to phrase this? Um, it pretty much gang, gangs up with you, not only with forcing you to grind, but also with um, with characters that if they're killed, they're dead permanently. Mm-hmm. Which means that that can, if you're if you're trying to level up uh, level up a party, that can pretty much make the grinding even more frustrating because then you start losing party members. So that means really, if you're trying to grind well, effectively, normally when you lose a party member in a game like that, though, you just reset. Yeah. yeah. Well, exactly. If you're trying to grind effectively, if things go your way. 
what happen when things keep on not going your way when you're grinding? Effectively, what you're effectively what you're doing is you're turning on and off your system repeatedly. Do you know how annoying that gets? Oh yeah, uh, my big thing was um, for grinding in that game particularly. I would come up with uh, techniques like for grinding Rams. Uh, I came up with the Y graph technique, uh, which I call the uh, "What the hell is he doing?" technique because that's the only thing I can imagine is Y graph standing there for four hours wondering what you're doing. Um, <laughs> But there's that, and I came up with a strategy in which I would um, take my characters into a fight, um, stop, uh, kill all the enemies until there was one left, stop that enemy, um, petrify any units that I weren't going to be um, uh, using for this. Then I would uh, turn the enemy into a frog and whatever characters I was going to grind into a frog, because frogs only do one damage to each other. And then I would uh, petrify the mage unless he was also going to be grinding, in which case I would turn him into a frog. <laughs> and then uh, literally walk away because uh, – oh, wait. Also, I would berserk the frogs um, so that uh, um, they would continue to attack each other and I could go get a sandwich. And sure, it's cheap, but uh, when it comes to grinding, sometimes you just have to find a method that works. <laughs> You that that's the method that you use because I was just mainly just going through the battle thing, and mm -hmm. plus whenever it came time for my I, when it came to getting actual experience, trying to just grind for that experience that I would need to get it higher magic or just higher skills in that certain class, I would take them to the bar and have them do propositions and do you know all that stuff. Oh yeah, that's what I did the first couple times, but after a while, I just I went for efficiency because I've already played the game so. If I want to play it again, um, a lot of times my playings go for, like, uh, bonus dungeons and stuff. But, yeah, that's that's tactics for you. It's um, yeah. interesting. I can't – I love the game, but it does have its problems when it comes yeah. to that. Because I don't think I mentioned the other element. But the other element is when you grind, the game suddenly becomes too easy because they don't scale the challenge to your level. Yeah. Yeah, that... I, I believe the top of the challenge, the final boss, is like level 50-something. You can go to level 99, and your challenge mostly comes from the bonus dungeon, but even the bonus dungeon, I believe, uh, the boss is capped at like level 88. So if you're level 99, you're just going to kick his ass. Yeah. I can honestly say this as well. Like When it comes to the whole grinding thing, I never really believed in it until I played Final Fantasy X and got to Mount Gigazette why I had to face Seymour for the third time and he kicked my ass and that's where i was going to say with tactics is i was using tactics as an example for grinding but it's not just tactics it's final fantasy as a whole especially is notorious for forcing you to grind mm -hmm. that's why i'm fond of um kingdom hearts because uh it's uh, if you don't want to grind it's skill based because uh, there are the people who do the level one challenges where they just uh, lock themselves in at level one using an ability that you can get. Uh, normally it's only in the Japanese versions, but I believe they've recently started putting it in the American versions to lock yourself in at level mm -hmm. one and beat the game based purely on skill using none of the um, level ups. And another game I like for this is the Tales series, um, Tales series games, because they... Uh, because it's an action RPG, it's got the Japanese RPG bits, it's got the story and everything, but if you're underleveled for a boss, you can still beat it just by being more awesome than the boss. Yeah, I mean, I like stuff I like stuff like that, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's my thing. If you're going to make a turn-based RPG, you know, you can have our RPG that has a battle system, you know? Whether it's random battle encounters or encounters you pick out, you know, have it where you can grind if you want. But but if you're just playing, where you don't have, where you're not forced to grind just to get through the story. Mm -hmm. Um, that's one of my least favorite aspects. <laughs> I have more. <laughs> yeah. One of m one of my personal beefs slash like bad things that I don't like in an RPG is the linear kind of thing that they did with Final Fantasy 13. I really do not like that. When so you take when, a game, yeah. When you take a game that's broad and that's, you know, 
known and renowned for its being able to go and branch out and do all these side quests and everything like that. And then you close it down to make it linear to make it play out to go straight through while also on top of already changing the battle system and everything and just changing everything about the game. It doesn't give me that same feel. That's what I really miss about the, these recent Final Fantasy games in 12 and 13. 12, not so much, but 13, you, you, you really just made me burn $60 with it. Yeah, I think um, the big thing is they've been trying to catch up with the um, graphics technology so much, and that's where the JRPGs, they now look at themselves as this is where you come for good graphics and good stories that they've been burning the gameplay aspect because there just aren't enough hours in the day to make a good game uh, or a uh, good gameplay for the game. And as I've th- said before, I think Square Enix just wants to make movies now. I, I think the RPG series that are doing really well nowadays are the series where we're going, okay, we're not going to make them look realistic as they stylize it. Yeah. They, because they stylize it, and then they're, that, get, that leaves them enough room to work on it. Tales of Vesperia was very well, very well praised because it's a, it's a Tales game. It was not linear. Um, yeah, I kind of got some flack because they, they only gave you one-third of the game. Um, but they they looked at a they they picked a style they got a stylized art style which they've had for a while and they just went with it. Mm-hmm. Shin Megami Tensei games have been doing oh, yeah. the same thing. Um, and yes, I think the one thing that especially now if if you're going, if you're doing this in RPGs you're going to kill yourself is linearity because it, people who are playing an RPG do not want a linear game. If they were going to play a linear game, they go play a platformer. Yeah. Um, and that's why uh, you mentioned Shin Megami Tensei. I think that's where the Persona games uh, came across a pretty revolutionary idea for the uh, concept is they took the um, tactical uh, turn-based combat and they um, all of the RPG elements, and they made a very linear story. It's a dungeon crawler, and that's pretty much as linear as you can get because you're just going level through level through a dungeon. But they added the aspect to during the day go out and make friends and by making friends talking to each other choosing your dialogue choices you can do it in whatever order you want so long as the story allows for it at the time and it's it's sure it's a linear game but they give you the nice mask of non-linearity yeah games that are just straight up linear you don't have much of a choice people don't want to do that and and people are going to be very very tired with that that's why you know the second part of the one-two punch that of a Nintendo-sponsored RPG that's going to be coming out, the last story. What what really is making me nervous right now is everything that they're, that they're touting. That uh, and the guy who's behind it is, by the way, the creator of Final Fantasy. Um, and they're touting as an evolution of the RPG. Is you're reading this and it sounds like an an action game, just a straight-up action game with very very basic RPG elements. And the one thing I found when I was reading it is as opposed to the other games, Xenoblade Chronicles, where you can go anywhere and explore anything, and you you can do whatever you want. You know, there's still a big story, but, you know, if you want to go explore and do side quests and just explore the world, you're welcome. This game, instead, they you pretty much get thrown in a very, very linear dungeon, go fight things, and the only exploration and customization you have at all is you maybe maybe a few um, few costumes that maybe, may, might, maybe, maybe not will do anything, and a hub, hub base. Everything else in the game is is straight up linear, which even most action RPGs are not linear. You know, mm-hmm. they give you freedom. This game is taking all that away. Um, I th- I'm going to say the one thing, like you said, dungeon crawlers. I guess is guess is one, but even other Shimigami Tensei uh, ge- uh, games, Kanzaki, you at least get to choose what dungeons you want to do in what order. Yeah. Um, one one type of RPG that can get away with being linear is again going to be the strategy RPGs. Um, because pretty much what, if you're playing a strategy RPG, the reason you're playing it is because of the, ta- of the tactical systems. Yeah. And that's going to be where all your death is. Um, one of the games I'm playing right now is Shining Force CD. The entire game consists of battle after battle after battle. There is no town segment. Pretty much in between battles is you have this little thing where you can change who's in your party, buy, buy and sell items, maybe heal some people and promote some people and save your game. That's it. There are no town segments. There's no exploration, but there's a lot of battling. So they, 
they allow that battle system to be deep, to be deep because really, that's what tactical RPG, that's what strategy RPG fans want is they want they are basically going to be focusing on just battling. Mm-hmm. That's one of the things I tout um, Fire Emblem: The Sacred Stones for. Is it's a strategy RPG, but they uh, managed to crowbar in a very interesting element of allowing you to travel from place to place, and this would allow for uh, a, ran- a semi-random encounter system. Like enemies would pop up, and you could go and fight them. And this would allow people who really wanted to grind, because um, if you're if you know the Fire Emblem series, you'll know that um, the grinding in those games usually amounts to sitting in a coliseum for hours on end, and if you get unlucky, you have to start it all over. Um, yep. So they allowed you to grind without the uh, risk of losing um, precious hours of your life. And at the same time, they give you a nice, robust difficulty setting. So on the hardest difficulty, even if you grind your ass off, it's still going to be nice and difficult. And damn you, Jin, you took the words right out of my freaking mouth. I was, as soon as Bubble was going to be done, I'm like, all right, I've got my thing. Darn it. He's jumped in and he's got it on me. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. It's all right, man. I mean, it's one of those things to where... When it comes to like the strategy RPGs, Fire Emblem is c- really, really close to my heart. It's one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah. I, I still keep Tactics right up there above it because I can keep going back to it over and over and over again, no matter how many times I've played it, and just play it mm-hmm. so many ways differently. Well, that actually also provides a segue segue for another one of my least favorite aspects. Um, and this is another one where I'm going to have to explain it. Um, random encounters. You don't like. Good. <laughs> Here's where I have to explain it. I don't quite mind random encounters if they're done well. Uh, for example, uh, Pokemon does it well because it tells you if you get into this grass, you have that chance of running to random encounters. Yeah, you it's know? not quite a random encounter because it can't happen everywhere. Yeah. It happens right the, in the random or in the uh, grass. There are various ways to do random encounters right. I thought of maybe doing a system where you only have random encounters and maybe in certain dungeons, or if you're on the field, is you won't have random encounters unless you enter an area that that kind of has a certain texture look, like maybe a foggy area. But mm-hmm. even then, I think it's not the random encounters that get get that get me. It's the rate of random encounters. I oh, think yeah. that's what people have a problem with. They don't mind random encounters, but they don't, they don't like that. You know, you do you get into battle and then you take one step you're in, into another battle. You yeah. need you need a little bit of leeway as far as how often you face those random encounters because people hate you know. Where it's constant, go eh, 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 over and over and over again. They don't mind having the chance of being of a battle coming up. They just don't want it to annoy them to death. Mm-hmm. Let's go into the rock wild. tunnel. Walk, 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 Zubat, son of a bitch. Walk, 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 Zubat, son of a walk, 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 Zubat. Yeah! And, and it's probably when designing a game, a a system of just scaling it back and figuring out that 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 I don't know how you would do it, but there has to be a way where you can scale the game where it's not going to annoy the player. Um, I was watch, watching a first impressions, for example, of Shimagami Tensei Three Nocturne, and how they handle the random encounters. There will be random encounters, but you have on your map icon is where it starts fla- it, where it flashes different colors. Okay, it'll be calm, and then it might get to yellow, and you know when it starts flashing red that there's a chance you'll fall into random encounter. Mm-hmm. So random encounters are annoying, aren't annoying because you know when you're gonna when you, when you're gonna fall into them, and it's not all the time. Um. Lord of the Rings: The Third Age did something similar. You know, random encounter. My thing is, random encounters when they're when they're done well, is they're okay because they're not annoying you. Is they they truly are random, but they're not random as in every other step. And when they do happen every other step, it doesn't happen all the time. It's just this gradual gradual random encounter. And if you're going to do random encounters, that's the way to do it. Not the annoying random encounters, but a nice. I don't know how how best you could describe that. Could describe this a a, a natural filling a balanced balanced random encounter system. Mm-hmm. It's actually interesting you bring up Nocturne because um, uh, Koizumi was playing uh, the game right next to me while I was doing the podcast last night. He uh, was able to find a brand new copy for thirty five dollars at uh, a nearby exchange place. Yeah. And it's because of people's hate of of basically this un, over this 
unbalanced random encounter system that is making a lot of people like where you can see the enemies on screen. That's why a lot of RPGs are shifting to that because people do not care for the random encounters. And like I said, I don't mind random encounters as long as they are not annoying me to death and I can at least have a little bit of a breather in between battles. That's why I like what Persona uh, did in that um, when you can see the enemy cluster. It's a blob on screen, and when you attack it or when it attacks you – uh, then you get to see what you're actually going to be fighting, which adds a bit of a random encounter element to it, but without actually, you can avoid the fight if you're um, not wanting to fight something at the moment, if you're just looking to climb as many floors as possible. Yeah, so I mean, you may say, say that those pet peeves are general pet peeves of the JRPG, but that's why I, I, I specified a little bit, because it's like, I don't have a problem with the idea per se, it's just the way it's been done. Yeah, a good what the uh, game is. with good execution, uh, those pet peeves aren't going to annoy you as much. No. Exactly. Just like with Mass Effect, for me, like it, there's sometimes where you get that chance for a – like you go around a corner, oh, crap, there's going to be people shooting at me. Or if you go around like a certain corner, there may be people wanting to talk to you, and you can either paragon your way out of things or renegade yourself into a battle or just you know go the neutral option and try not to get yourself shot. <laughs> Yeah. Any other any other least favorite aspects I'm going to have is going to be coupled with favorite aspects where I explain my fa- – when we get to favorite aspects where I explain what my favorite aspects are, and then I'll give an example of games that do it right and games that don't do it right. But I, as far as least favorite, favorite aspects, I've, I've explained mine. So yeah, another, moving on. Yeah, another least favorite of mine is the idea of um, – uh, a game that uh, is trying to make itself look, and I believe um, The World Ends With You was guilty of this one. They tried to make it seem like you were actually playing the role, like you were having an effect on what was going on, but really it wasn't. Like, um, there was an infamous uh, part where you are you get a clue, and uh, if you have half a brain, you can figure out the clue. But they wheel you to another area. Uh, you can't go to the area that the clue tells you to go to until you go to another area to um, get a uh, cutscene where they tell you what the answer to the clue is. That kind of thing irritates the crap out of me. Basically, where you can basically where if you can figure it out or if you want to or play the game before you can skip it. Yeah. Yeah. The idea that, that – well, it's not even sk- the idea of skipping something. It's just the idea that if I'm smart enough to figure something out, let me continue on. And um, I like uh, bringing up Fallout 3 again. It uh, did this well, and um, even New Vegas. It, the idea is that if you either figure something out or maybe if you just stumble across something at random, you can bypass parts of the main story because um, you figured out something else that allows you to bypass those segments. Old RPGs did this very well as well. For example, I was playing uh, Final Fantasy Adventure. I'm getting ready for a Let's Play. Um, there's a part – I did it mainly because I would do it in the, in the LP, but I know when I was looking over some stuff earlier and getting ready for it is that it is possible to skip doing the little side quest to find out some information because you can actually go without doing it and do it yourself, and it will open up the door. You don't mm-hmm. need to do the side quest. So people, people have, who have done it before will even say in their walkthrough – you can just skip this and go straight here and do this. Um, and I'm going to build onto you, your your pet peeve, it, your least favorite aspect, because it also couples and it's about the same thing. Because you're t- you're talking about you know taking away the freedom where if you can figure something out, you know, not being able to do so is a least favorite aspect. I, on the same regards, is if if the game is talking about how you can affect affect your world, which is similar to what you're talking about. But you're not able to affect – basically your choices mean nothing, mm-hmm. and that was – if we're going to talk about the Mass Effect 3, 3 uh, um, fallout over that, that was what the problem was. A lot of people felt that their choices in the end had no consequence, mm-hmm. and uh, that's what pissed people off. Yeah, and a big thing is people don't – a lot of people are trying to jump in the argument without uh, completely understanding what that means of – like the Penny Arcade argument, and I respect the hell out of them, but their yeah. argument was that, well, the entire game's the ending, and throughout the game you got to see your uh, decisions uh, taking place. But I was like, no, that's that's the uh, natural yeah. progression. Yeah. I'm talking about the actual ending of this game yeah. in that you were promised that you were going to be building a world that your Commander Shepard could live in, 
and they uh, t basically decided that no matter what you do, he's either dead, or if you're really, if you choose a specific option they want you to choose, with as uh, complete, uh, the most completion over the three games as you can, they will hint that he might have lived. Yeah, I mean, I'm always making these arguments, and I, I'm going to be honest, I have not played Mass Effect 3, but the reason I am making these arguments is because when that art, when that controversy came out is I did extensive reading up on it. I read the Penny Arcade argument. I read multiple arguments. I even watched a video where the guy broke down the arguments and was showed it by all Angry three. Joe? I forget who it was. The guy yeah. the guy basically showed all the promises that were made by the by the studio, uh, showed what actually happened and showed all three endings. So I am very well versed on what actually happened. Yeah, as I've uh, said, um, and I even did a review of it because it irritated me this much, is um, the I have a conspiracy theory around the uh, new extended ending DLC because it, this I don't think this thing really made anyone happy because the people that uh, are going to enjoy this are the people who already like the ending, and the people who didn't like the ending, this is not going to make them like it. And the only reason I believe they released this uh, thing was so that they could rally their uh, the fans they still have around to point the finger at the old fans and say, oh, well, they'll never be happy with anything we give them. Yeah, I mean, there's a difference between promise between having it, having an ending. You could say, okay, it was a bad ending, but there's a difference between having an ending where you were promised to have have the option to change things and there is if you're having multiple endings that really there's no change in the multiple endings to having a a game where basically an undeserved an undeserved bad ending which is the case with the Mass Effect series where the bad ending is comes out of nowhere doesn't make sense and it's undeserved to where an ending might be bad might be bad like bad things happen but it feels it, there's integrity because it feels part of the game. Mm -hmm. Again, Shin Megami Tensei, very first game. At the very end, they blew, they actually I don't even think it was in. I think it was middle of the game. Is they is nuclear bomb in J Japan. Shin Megami Tensei will go dark. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, um, which is actually but, one of the um, things I found interesting about bringing up Persona Three and Four again is. Um, Persona 4, or Persona 3 has a dark tone, but the story is relatively lighthearted. Um, or rather, um, yeah, the, the, like the feel of the game is dark. The story has a slightly dark tone, but overall it's not so bad. Um, you're just dealing with, you know, everyday life for the most part um, with the shadows. With Persona 4, you're dealing with murder. And they balance that by having a really lighthearted cast, and they—I mean—they take the story serious, or they take the what's happening seriously, but at the same time they keep it balanced so that you're never overwhelmed by one part or one aspect of the game. Yeah, I guess here, here's the thing: if we're going to talk about Mass Effect Three, you know, if you're going to say, "Well, everything gets destroyed," well, that's fine, but at least ha ha make it feel like the game had integrity, and that we can walk away feeling like that was that the game respected us with the, with those choices and that it felt, you know, you, you walked away from the game going, well, it may not have been a happy ending, but I felt that the game respected the player because there can be other games where they will destroy the world, but you'll still walk away going, you know, that makes sense given the context. I still felt I had that the game respected me as a, as a, as a, as a whole, and that's what the game was really leading up to anyway. Mm-hmm. Which is why uh, the Persona 3 ending is so powerful is because they get you invested in the story. They get you invested in your character. You build your character. You build your friendships. And then they kill you. Yeah. I, I oh, guess spoilers! <laughs> <laughs> no, the, you will see it uh, coming from the very beginning of the game. That is the least spoilerific thing you've ever heard. Yeah. Um, More than likely. I guess that's the thing with JRPGs over Western RPGs is because JRPGs are allowing them to be, allowing themselves to be the vehicles of storytelling is you know for sure that while you may have control over how you play the game, that as far as the story is, they're in control. Mm -hmm. But you're there for the story. Yeah. Where, where, where with Western games is they're giving you, giving you control. 
So basically, by giving you control and by being it being you centric, at the same time they have to respect that when building the game. And by saying, "Oh no, you had no control in the first place," as um, as Bioware tried to try to claim with with artistic integrity, well, if you're going to build an, a Japanese style RPG in the first place, then don't give us the illusion of control. Yeah, I think Seinfeld said it best. You don't have you're not an artist, and you have no integrity, Bioware. Yeah, you have. If you're going to give us the the illusion of control, then if you're going to give us the ability of control, basically give us control, then that means if you're going to have multiple endings, they need to be different. However, if you're going to do, if you're going to let this be a vehicle for a story, then don't give us the illusion for of control and just let us play the game. Mm -hmm. And that's where Bioware went wrong. They went the Western RPG route, but in the end, they didn't want to be a Western RPG. They wanted to be a, a Japanese style RPG with the vehicle for a story, and that's where they screwed up. And I think uh, there's another part of it too. I think it's the idea that they want to continue the story even if they're not using Shepard, so they tied the endings together as light or as closely as they could, so that they could make a new game without requiring like 50 discs. Because we were promised a massively open-ended game because it was going to be the last in a trilogy, and it was going to do that. But uh, if they would have done that, then any future Mass Effect project would have had to have been massive to account for all of the different uh, possible uh, continuities. Yeah. And and here here's the here's the thing that Japanese RPGs also do right is there are a few JRPGs that do give you a little bit of control of where the where the story goes. But in that case, is the endings end up being wildly different. So mm. you know, it's it's not like it's the same art, it's the same ending, but with a different color. And if they do do a sequel, see, this is what Bioware should have thought with: is like, okay, let's just give them wildly different endings, and if we make a sequel, we'll 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 do it, and like, we'll you can't carry over any stats, and we'll basically make a canonical sequel. Like, okay, only this ending was canonical. Yeah, that's what a lot of games choose to do that. Yeah, that's what a lot of JRPGs do is, okay, you can have multiple endings, but if we make a sequel, this ending was canonical. The other endings are you know, just for you, and you know, people don't have a problem with that. I think that's why you probably like Chrono Trigger a lot is because with Chrono Trigger, with some of your choices that you were able to make, you, it affected the ending a little bit. Just like little well, tweaks and minor things here and there. Well, to be honest with the with the model endings on Chrono Trigger, you can't get most of those model endings until after you, until you, after you play through the game one time. Um, okay. Well, the first time you play the game, the game has one ending. The only now there there can be a difference in how the game looks uh, to the ending, but it's little minor differences that first time. And those minor differences will be if you did not save Magus, Magus will not be present in that ending. Where if you did, he will. And there's something about you getting multiple cats. And basically, if you kept on getting cats, is all those cats will be present in the ending. Hmm. But for the main ending, that's the only difference. Now, the, now, after you play again, uh, Chrono Trigger and Chrono Cross, as well as a few other RPGs, have something called New Game Plus. And basically, Chrono Trigger and Chrono Cross each have cano canonical endings, which is what you play the, get, get the first time. And basically, their multiple endings ha uh, have to do with New Game Plus. And you get those by facing, the, by facing the end boss at different points. You're basically allowed to face the end boss whenever you want at this point. And depending on when you face the end boss and who you get, you'll get multiple endings. And see, here's the thing, like, for me, like, when it comes to the whole story and the RPG element where you're able to just go and do whatever, the game that really perfected it for me would be Final Fantasy VI. Love the story, love the fact that, you know, the first half of the game, yeah, it's one of those things to where it's, to progress the story, you have to go to these key locations. After that, after the whole World of Ruin part happens, you have the option to start going and grabbing certain things. Like you can go under the under the earth and grab the things that are in the castle ruin to where you can get, you know, like the uh, master scroll or, you know, whatever. And you can go to uh, the tower of just where you only can use magic. I love those elements from that. Now, I know you were talking about the multiple endings as well, and I, I thought just to end that off because um, we talk about multiple endings being wildly different. Chrono Trigger also had fun with multiple endings because we're not talking like like multiple endings depending on your choice. When they're talking about multiple endings, they, they're talking about things that some of these multiple endings are just hilarious. They just like, well, let's just do something where everybody's dinosaurs. That works. 
or one of the multiple endings is actually um, a meeting with the game's producers. I mean, <laughs> they, they had fun with the endings. <laughs> That's what I like about uh, moving a bit out of RPG territory, but just good games, is uh, not taking yourself completely seriously. Like, Silent Hill 2, for the most part, is very serious, but if you're on your second playthrough... <laughs> and you find a key in a doghouse and meet a couple other criteria, you can uh, find out at the end that uh, all of the stuff that was happening was actually being controlled by a dog in a um, secret room uh, full of switches. <laughs> it's just a silly thing, but it's uh, kind of satisfying uh, to see just James's uh, look on his face as he realizes that uh, everything he suffered for was just stupid. <laughs> uh, are there any other least favorite aspects i'm actually um i figure we uh should uh wind up because we're getting pretty long here and i thought of um eddie mentioned it uh in the um thing here is uh one of the games that managed to be linear but still be very fun and you you get the same ending every time but it's very uh it's skill based, so you want to get the ending, and that is Pokemon. Pokemon, Pokemon, because Pokemon well, po is a very linear game, but it sheds that bit of linearity by allowing you to collect. Yeah, well, well, to be honest, Pokemon, uh, except with a few exceptions, Pokemon has never been very strong in the story story department. Um, the main the main plot of Pokemon is. You want to be, you want to basically become Pokemon champion. Oh, and there's also some bad guys doing something or other, and you just keep on coming across them. That's pretty much Pokemon in the nut, nut in a nutshell. Um, it's a very it's normally a very light story, and the focus is instead on the collecting and battling uh, system. Mm -hmm. That's the that's like the surface of it. But if you really really get in depth with it, and you want to go like the competitive side routes, it gets really really in depth with stats training and you know grinding for those evs or ives it, it, again that's just the surface you're scratching right there when you come to that can't but really if you're grind going, well ives, well though. when I, I, i'm sorry <laughs> no it's fine um well when i'm when i'm looking at pokemon is like you're talking about com pe uh, competitive pokemon battling where you're battling like, battling against other players and that's all, all fine and good but if we're going to talk about rbgs we need to focus on the actual actual game and chances are you're not really building up for competitive. That is a whole different side that uses the RPG system for a whole different purpose, but the main RPG is not gearing up for competitive Pokemon gaming. I know, but I just forgot you go ahead and mention that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think Pokemon is uh, a good gauge of where RPGs have come, is that they... Uh, it shows that someone can uh, perfect their craft because um, they didn't do it right the first time. Some people will say they did, but they didn't. And I'm not referring to the Pokemon themselves. I'm referring to the battle system. As they create new moves, they're able to balance everything better. And it just – everything um, flows really nicely now. And uh, there's a Pokemon for everyone now. I mean there's over 700 of the damn things. Yeah. And, and the thing you have to under, understand about Pokemon also is that it's an it's essentially a beginner RPG. Yeah, it, it was designed to basically get people to play RPGs. Mm -hmm. So if, of course it's not the most complicated RPG out there. It's just it just has the basics. Mm -hmm. It is, um, which is something I find interesting because, as you say, it's not the most complicated. But in the same vein, it's also more complicated than most because the. Um, the deeper side of the stat system that most people are never even going to think about. Yeah, I guess that's that 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 will have that's going to be part of a favorite aspect that we can get into next time because I will want to be talking about battle systems. Mm -hmm. But that's for another uh, thing. Yeah, I think it's about time for us to end up for the night because we're well or well not well over. We're about three minutes after an hour, but still. Good times. Bye. Good times. So next time, favorite aspects and other stuff. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Try and put in some news if uh, there's actually some news worth hearing. Well, I mean, the reason I said next time is that way it could be a while before we talk about RPGs again. So yeah. just next time we talk about RPGs. Yeah. Because we're not done. <laughs> oh, we'll <laughs> never be done.